Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Open STEM Labs at the Open University. I'm Dave Rothery. I'm the chair of S283, our Level 2 Planetary Science course, and the lead educator on the Moon's MOOC. With me tonight is my colleague, Mark Fox Powell, who you will meet um, very soon. Let me just say what this is about. Uh, we've invited people from the Moon's MOOC and S283 and the wider OU Planetary Science community to, to come along this evening. Um, our main purpose is to answer your questions, some of which have come in, 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 have come in, in advance, others of which will hopefully you'll be asking if you're watching live um, via the widget. Um, but we want to tell you a little bit about ourselves. Well, I want you to hear about Mark, and uh, we'll pick up on some news items that, that are current that we'd like to share with you, and then we'll go into the questions. So, Mark, I've seen you in the corridors off and on, <laughs> uh, in between bouts of COVID closing the place down. That's right, yes. Please uh, tell us what you do, because you're in Astrobiology OU, yeah? Yeah, that's right, Dave. So, thank you, and, and hi, everyone. So, I'm a, I'm a research fellow um, in Astrobiology OU, which means I spend a lot of my time doing scientific research. And uh, kind of my, my objects of interest here are uh, uh, icy moons in the solar system that, that have subsurface liquid water oceans. And in particular, those subset of those that we think are, are good candidates for being habitable environments that uh, potentially could support life. So, so two examples are behind Dave here, where we have Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, and Europa, moon of Jupiter. So these moons, um, as, you'll, as you'll all be, be aware, they have uh, thick icy shells, which kind of block all the sunlight. So any potential biology in the subsurface would be existing based on chemical energy released through hydrothermal interactions. Yeah, and I think S283 students, and by this stage, moon MOOC learners will be aware of this. So they'll, under, they'll know where you're at with this. Great, that's so, great. So my, yeah. my, my job actually really is to try and figure out, and what I'm really interested in is the processes that go on uh, uh, that may be occurring in the icy shells of these, of these objects to transfer materials from the ocean to the surface. And the reason for this is that we can't really access the oceans um, under any kind of technological uh, uh, feasibilities that we have right now. But, so we have to rely on, on surface features to really learn about the chemistry of that subsurface ocean. So what I do is I do both kind of lab experiments to simulate these, um, these processes and also a bit of field work actually to go to places on Earth that have uh, analogous features, analogous chemistries. Uh, I've got an example here of some of my lab uh, samples. So what do you think of that, Dave? Well, I happen to know it's not really from Enceladus, but it's simulating Enceladus. And, and surprisingly, even though it's not really from Enceladus, it's quite exciting to be holding it. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean... Tell us more about it. It gives you that feeling. I mean, it's, it's almost... You can imagine in a few decades' time, maybe we will have samples returned mm. from Enceladus. But um, as, you, as you might be aware, Enceladus has these these large plumes, and I've got an image of that. So this is plumes, a fantastic image taken by the Cassini spacecraft, showing those plumes backlit. And we know now that these are actually ejecting material from the ocean into space. And that material is freezing really rapidly. So what I do in the lab essentially is simulate that process. And what's in this vial in my hand is um, salts that form within these tiny droplets of, of frozen fluid that I can then extract from the ice to do, to do various chemical analyses on. So I can show you in a bit more detail over here. And these plumes have been flown through by Cassini and could be visited in future with a better equipped spacecraft. That's yeah. exactly right, yeah. So these, plu these plumes will cap particles in these plumes, icy particles captured by Cassini, and similar approaches will be taken at, at Europa if plumes exist at yeah. Europa. So if we have a close look on the close-up camera, um, I've got here a vial, which is exactly the same material I was just showing Dave uh, just a minute ago there in the, uh, in the other vial. It, it looks a little bit like icing sugar, not much, not very special to look at with, with the naked eye. But what we can do is mount it in epoxy blocks like this one here. And you might notice, again, quite hard to see, but these wispy, cloudy white material here are these what I call cryo salts. These are salts that form during the rapid freezing of these Enceladus analog fluids. And now, again, not much to look at with the naked eye, but I have some images here to show you what they look like on the micro scale. When we look at the micro scale images like this one on your screen now, it's about a tenth of a, mi a millimeter across this image. And what you're seeing here, this structure, is actually uh, the salts that 
form within the, ice, within the ice crystals themselves. And the ice has been removed by sublimation. We get rid of that ice, we extract the salts out, and that allows us to do analyses on these salts. Mm -hmm. So you can look in a little bit more detail with a, a, a higher resolution image. Now we're looking really, really small scale, about 20 micrometers, 20 thousandths of a millimeter across this image. And you can see a, a whole range of different salt minerals that have formed very, very rapidly within these rapidly freezing ice grains. Are those mostly sodium chloride? Because I know you said cubic, but, but are there other salts as well in your mixture? Yeah, so this mixture is designed based on Cassini data from the plume particles. It involves sodium chloride. Yes, that's what you're seeing, exactly those cubic salts. We also have these tiny microcrystalline carbonates, and, and that actually sets the Enceladus ocean apart from, from Earth's oceans, but having this very carbonate-rich, high pH fluid. Um, so another aspect of my work um, I'd like to just mention is that I also, as well as looking at uh, lab analogs of some of these processes, I do sometimes go on and do field work. So I've got a couple of images here to show you examples of that. Uh, this is a field trip from last uh, August in Svalbard, north of Norway. And here we're looking at ice deposits that are, have upwelled through subglacial drainage that have refrozen on the surface. And this gives us an idea of some of the chemical processes that might be going on as fluids are deposited on the surface of a moon-like Are these like fluids Europa. bringing up or terrestrial organisms from below the ice to the, towards the surface? Yeah, well, that's the theory. That's what we're there actually going there to, to find out. Okay. Do we, are we finding evidence for subglacial communities, microbial communities, but life frozen into these ice deposits? And what can we learn about them by studying those ice deposits? Um, there's another example uh, image here. This is from the Canadian Arctic. This is actually a, a, a brine spring. All of that material is salt rather than ice. And um, uh, again, these salts are really similar in composition to salts detected on the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. And, uh, and by studying how they form on Earth, we might learn something about the same kind of chemical processes going on on Europa. Oh, thanks for that, Mark. No problem. So Dave, um, viewers might realize that you are involved in ESA's Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury. Indeed. Um, but uh, we, we might get some questions about Mercury later on. But um, in the meantime, has anything in your, caught your attention in the news recently? Well, but yes, it has. There was a lovely uh, story that was published in Nature Communications only on Tuesday this week about wow. the ice volcanoes on Pluto. And that's what I, I brought along to share with people. Um, Pluto was flown past by New Horizons in 2014. Is mm -hmm. it 2014? Eight years ago. Amazing. Really. Crikey. Can we see the first picture? But this is an oblique view across part of Pluto, and the feature in the right foreground is known as Wright Mons. It's uh, believed to be an icy volcano. There's all the hummocks in the foreground as well, and the hole in the middle of the volcano. Um, this is a, a big structure. You'll see its scale in a while, but it's some hundreds of kilometres across and some thousands of metres high. Uh, we can have a look of you to, just to see its, its global setting, how big it is. OK, the view on the right includes right mons. You'll recognise the hole in the middle of it. Uh, and the view on the left shows a, little, shows a square or rectangle that's been expanded up onto the right. So it's a relatively small part of Pluto. And this is quite a young region. There aren't any impact craters superimposed on the right mons terrain. Uh, which means its age can't really be more than a billion years. I mean, and it doesn't sound young. I was going to say, that doesn't sound <laughs> but young. It's, only, it's a quarter of the age of the solar system. Most things on most bodies were going on in the first billion years of history, not carrying on today. So it's a young structure. And uh, let's have a look at um, a, a, a downward view on it. So there is, is right mons. The terrain upper right is a kind of chaotic region of broken up ice. We should concentrate on the volcanic terrain, which is around... Uh, right mons there. Um, let's see it in cross-section uh, because that gives you its scale. Now, the uh, four red lines are the big volcanoes on, on Mars, the biggest being Olympus mons. Right mons is the black line. And you see it's about four or five kilometres high. And the hole in the middle, the base of that hole, is the same level or even deeper than the surrounding terrain. A very strange hole in the middle. The little blue line is the... Uh, part of Mauna Loa in Hawaii that's above sea level. So right mons is a substantial thing, bigger than Mauna Loa really, and it's on a much smaller body. Pluto is about 
less than 2,000 kilometers right. radius. Right, yeah. yeah. So, so this is a substantial um, four, four uh, structure. Not, for, as given dominant, the size. not as dominant as Olympus Mons on Mars, but right. still pretty damn big. Yeah. And it's an eruption, it's a cryovolcanic eruption mm -hmm. uh, involving ice, and it appears to be water ice. They've done some spectral studies. Um, and it's water ice coming out. You, might, you may have noticed many different mounds around the outside. Yeah. Looking at the strength of these mounds, it's too strong to be anything but water ice. So we imagine a crystal-rich mush or maybe a, a, a solid rind of ice surrounding a mushy interior as it was oozed out. And this volcanic feature was built up by multiple eruptions. Um, and you might think the hole in the middle is a crater. That's what I did first time I saw it, an explosion feature or event that's collapsed. But... The authors of this paper, it's Kelsey Singer from mm. Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, they're saying they don't think the hole in the middle is a volcanic crater. They think it's just a place where eruptions didn't happen for some reason. Huh. Um, so just a kind of a random it, yeah, result flute, of the... Yeah, it, 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 they say it's too big to be a volcanic crater. But the uh, reason I'm not keen on that is they found a, a similar feature just beyond the Terminator, it was in the dark, mm -hmm. in darkness when the New Horizons flew by, because Pluto had ro was rotating as it was approaching, and they, they saw it at low resolution during approach, but by the time they got close, it had rotated into darkness, but yeah. Pluto has a hazy atmosphere, and scattered light from the haze illuminated the surface well enough to see this other wow. feature. My last picture shows you a, a digital elevation model, color-coded, so you, you probably recognize right Mons at the top with the sort of yellow rim around it, if you look in the very southern part, you've got the blue central hole around another ring-like mm. mountain, which is known as mm. Picard Mons. And to have two ice volcanoes formed with holes in the middle that are just flukes, but are right next to each other, is a bit too much of a fluke for me. I think these holes in the middle are telling us something about the process that either constructs or, having constructed, partially destroys these edifices. I don't think they're flukes. But yeah, we don't know. Uh, but anyway, relatively recent, past billion years, ice, water ice, cryovolcanism on Pluto. That's very I exciting. I think that's a nice story. Yeah. Now, I think you've got a new story to share before we go on to the questions. Yes. Right? Well, uh, so I, I attended the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference back in March, and, and yeah. there was a, some reports of a, of, of a recent flyby of the Juno spacecraft of one of, of Jupiter's moons. Now, Juno... Um, was a, it has been at studying Jupiter since 2016. That's its primary target. Its mission was just extended in 2021 for another five years. And the point of the extended mission is to study Jupiter's moons. So that's a sequence of flybys. We, there was one flyby of Ganymede. The first of these encounters was in June last year. And Ganymede, here's a, here you can see on your screen an image from the Juno encounter with Ganymede. So the closest approach here was 13, about 1,300 kilometers. And what you're looking at here is the, what we call the sub-Jovian hemisphere. So this is the, the region of Ganymede that is facing Jupiter. G Ganymede is tidally locked to Jupiter, so this side yep. always faces Jupiter. And, and what, we've, what we've done here is, is they've massively increased the resolution of these images. And also, by taking images of this part of Ganymede from a, from a, a perpendicular geometry, they're actually much more able to reconstruct the geometry of some of these uh, surface features and, and learn more about it. Now, it's very hot off the press. A lot of the talks I was watching at the conference were very much just saying, look at this amazing, these amazing images we have. We're still trying to figure out what's going on. Some of the, they've discovered some new craters, which are um, over 100 kilometers in diameter that previously uh, in the Galileo imagery from the late 90s, we couldn't see. That's a surprise to miss something that big. It's amazing, it's good yeah. we've got Juno there. Yeah, uh, Ganymede is, is, a, is, a, is an amazing kind of middle ground between two of the other icy moons of Jupiter. We have uh, Callisto, which is, has a very old cratered surface, icy surface, and Europa, which has a, a much younger, disrupted, active surface that doesn't have many impact craters. And um, Ganymede's a kind of middle ground between them. So it's, it's a very interesting kind of Rosetta Stone sort of approach to understand both uh, the whole kind of icy uh, Jupiter system there. And this is a big bonus, isn't it? Because Juno was essentially a geophysical mission to study the magnetic field of Jupiter and its gravity field. That's and right. And added the cameras quite late, which had produced some stonking pictures of Jupiter's storm systems. And now it's imaging the moons as well through close flybys. That's right. And, and, and I tell you, there are some fantastic images that, I, that we can't show because they're still kind of hot off the press. And, and if we wait until the end of 2022, Juno will be flying by Europa. 
um, the, the, the extremely active icy moon of, 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 um, of Jupiter, shown in the image here. It will be flying by at an altitude of 320 kilometers, which is very, very low. We should, we should get some extremely good high-resolution imagery. So that's an exciting thing to, to look forward to there. I hope they go across Connemara chaos as people who've studied S283 will, will know. But any chaos region. Any chaos region, these slightly mysterious, very mysterious, very young regions where we might actually have subsurface fluids recently interacting with the surface environment. That's yeah, extremely that exciting. That would be great. OK, let's go on to answering your questions. And I don't see any live questions yet. So, come on, we may have from uh, said lose some chain, trains of thought in your, your minds. Ask us some questions, please. We're, we like to test ourselves with live questions, but we've had plenty in advance. An S283 student, um, Victor Orebski, asks, and really this is for you, more than me, Mark. Do you think non-carbon based life is possible? Is there a general scientific consensus about this? And is non-carbon based life being actively investigated by astrobiologists? Well, there's, there's a few nested questions there and I think, I think it's important to understand, yes, it absolutely is possible. That there are proposals of, of alternate chemistries from carbon that um, theoretically makes sense, and we shouldn't rule them out as being possible somewhere. So, for example, silicon is one of the ones that gets talked about a lot, and the reason for that is that silicon can actually form a lot of different complex molecules, a bit like carbon can, and it can polymerize and, and, and everything like that. And, and people have suggested ways, researchers have suggested ways in which silicon-based molecules might be able to actually carry information uh, but in a very similar way to DNA. The problem with silicon, though, is that silicon, um, when it binds to something like oxygen, is very, very stable. And it suddenly becomes very difficult for silicon to, to, to break those bonds and to form new molecules. Carbon, by comparison, the bonds can break and they can shift and, and, and you can form new molecules quite easily. And, and actually, one thing that I kind of keep coming back to um, is that you know, we actually live on a, on a big ball of silicon. The Earth and terrestrial planets are, are very compared to things like carbonaceous chondrites, are quite, sil quite carbon poor and silicon rich. And despite that, we are still, biology, the biosphere is still carbon based. So if we talk about probabilities and what we should be looking for, we, we, the probability of coming across a carbon based uh, bi a biosphere is just more likely. Carbon is more abundant in the universe as a molecule. Uh, sorry, it, carbon chemistry is more abundant. Yeah, we, we know life can be based on carbon. Exactly. We don't know that life can be based on silicon. So if we want to look for life, we're better off focusing on carbon. That's but exactly now, right. Yeah. yeah, I see the sense in that. Yeah, and, and the question of, of whether active research is going on into this, I mean, that is a good question. And I think one thing that we can't rule out is, is exotic carbon-based life. It has very different chemistry mm -hmm. to our own, but it's still based on carbon. And an example of that might, might be something that can exist in the, in the lakes of methane that we see on the, on the surface of Saturn's moon Enceladus. And there are groups out there doing research into how cell membranes and things might assemble and form um, uh, uh, under these kind of conditions. So, so that research is ongoing, and, and I think we can't rule out um, exotic carbon-based life. I guess not, but water's a polar solvent and methane isn't, am I right? That's so right, yeah. Processes it, it, might be rather different. Processes are very different yeah. and, and very much slower because it's much colder, so yeah. rates of reaction are a lot slower. Yeah. So um, there's actually a question here that probably is good for you, Dave. So Ian Thayer uh, from the Moon's MOOC has this question. Um, Ian asks... That he, say, he says he attends Sir Patrick Moore's 80th birthday in, in 2004, and, and Patrick Moore said that, in his opinion, the greatest discovery on Mars up to that point was the discovery of the polar caps. Now, in the 18 years that have passed since then, have there been any other interesting discoveries on Mars? And, and in your opinion now, what is the greatest discovery? <laughs> yeah. we, were dis we were discussing this earlier. I, I'm wondering what Patrick was referring to, because the polar caps were discovered on Mars actually in the 18th century mm. and suggested to be made of water ice in the 19th century, you know, transported around the globe by these fictitious canals, and proven to be water by spectroscopy sometime in the mid 20th century, I guess. So um, what stage were they discovered? But, but, but 
finding a planet with substantial amounts of, of water in frozen state yeah. was an important discovery. I would agree with Patrick about that. I, I'm not sure what point they were discovered. It's one of these incremental things. And in a similar vein, but there isn't a sort of light bulb moment occurring about Mars subsequent to that. It all builds up incrementally. Yeah, but, but, that's right. Yeah, and the thing that most caught my attention, or maybe most satisfied about exploring Mars, was only was it two years ago when the Perseverance lander landed by parachute. Amazing, yeah. Um, on the crater floor in front of a delta deposit, yes. which geologists would recognise as a delta. We'd seen the digital elevation models of the delta. That's right. And the camera views on the way down swung round, and you could see the front of a delta, which we recognised straight from the, the digital elevation models. And then when it landed, you could see the delta front in the distance. It, and the rover is now heading towards that delta front, having studied the deposits on the crater floor. But seeing that delta yes. dangling below the parish, from dangling below the parish, to me, that was... Uh, that was a pivotal, a pivotal moment in planetary exploration. It wasn't a discovery of, as such. We knew what we were going to see and we wanted to understand how it came to be. And now we're doing that with a rover and a helicopter. And a say. helicopter that has, uh, has far exceeded everyone's expectations of how, how many flights it would be operating under. Yeah, yes. who would have thought with a, with a very low density atmosphere that helicopters would be possible? It's it's marvelous. So I think it doesn't I think, quite answer the question. Do you have a well? I mean, on Mars? It, it, it links to that really. I mean, it, it's you were talking about the delta, and I think you know there has been this recognition that Mars used to be a lot more like the Earth in terms of the amount of water and the water yeah. activity on the surface. But it's it's the recognition now through the last few rover missions that that those the chemistry of those water environments were also really kind of habitable, really really clement environments for for life. And, and would have been quite similar to some of the environments on the early Earth. So I think that's actually a really exciting development in, in, mm. in the exploration of Mars yeah. as well. We've had some questions live. We have. Um, OK, Robert Forbes is asking, are the periods of plumes and cryovolcanism on the icy moons influenced by similar factors to those on, on the Earth, like Old Faithful? I mean, do the, do the plumes on Enceladus pulse? They, they, do, they do fluctuate in their magnitude, definitely. So that's a really good question, Robert. I, th I think we only really have the one example um, th uh, of, of these plumes. We have other potentials and, and candidate plumes um, on Europa and also nitrogen plumes on, on, on Neptune's moon Triton. But the ones that we've really observed uh, are the Enceladus plumes. And they're thought to effectively, uh, since, the, since we've been observing them, to be, to be constant features although they do fluctuate in, in magnitude, and, and that's thought to be tied to gravitational interactions between Saturn and, and Enceladus as the, as the ice shell flexes. Um, but the, effectively, that liquid reservoir is, is on some level open to, to the vacuum of space and is boiling and releasing and volatiles, and, and that's flinging off these, these droplets of fluid into space. So in some way, yes, it's very similar to uh, geysers on Earth, like Old Faithful, where you have superheated water the uh, volatiles coming out of solution and flinging that into the air. There is an analogy there for sure. Um, but of course, the, the temperature conditions and the thick atmosphere on Earth make it quite a different environment that it's ejected into. Let me ask you this question from Danilo uh, Pierpaoli. Do we know how thick the ice is on Europa, the surface ice? I don't think we do, do we? We'd love to know. <laughs> yeah, that's a big <laughs> outstanding question. And it's something actually that Juno might help with a little yeah. bit. But um, no. yeah, we, we're definitely well, definitely Juice, the Jupiter icy yeah. moons explorer, okay. which will 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 follow um, in the late 2020s. Um, but the estimates are, are usually between 10 and 30 kilometers. Some people go even as thin as five or two. But I think that those are kind of outlier predictions. Usually, we're in the 10 to 30. You're talking about range. the average ice shell, but that's the, right. But if melt through happens to produce chaos, then it goes to zero. But it could go to zero potentially. If the, if the chaos regions are formed through complete melt through, then that in the, the time those are forming, it could be zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll so, keep asking those. Yeah. We'll, we'll come absolutely. back. Um, okay. Right. There's a question on from an S283 student, John Mayle. Um, when the sun becomes hotter uh, in a couple of billion years' time, uh, would we expect some of the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn to become liquid water moons for a while? Well, 
Possibly. I mean, I think it, it, it very much depends on, on um, whether you're talking about the, the kind of main sequence lifetime of the sun or, or w towards the very end of the sun's life in, in, in more than two billion years when it grows into the, the red giant stage. And, and effectively, when you heat up these worlds, like Enceladus, Europa, um, they will, the, the water will melt first and then it will volatilize. It, the, these moons will lose those volatiles. They don't have the gravity to hold on to them like we do in, the, in some of the larger mm. planets. So they might have a small window of time where they, uh, they have their kind of time in the sun and become these, these balmy ocean worlds. But, but that, won't be very, that will be quite short-lived in, in total. So I've, I've got one here for you, Dave, yep. actually, um, from the Moon's MOOC. Jeff Burt asks, uh, what is the latest status regarding exomoons? So now we're, we're, going, we're leaving the solar system. So I gather, uh, Jeff asks, a few possible candidates have been identified, but no confirmed discovery yet. Maybe the first confirmation is expected by the end of this year? Well, um, actually, Jeff, some would say the first confirmation happened this very month. There's a paper in Nature Astronomy uh, led by, what's the guy's name, David Kipping et al., which um, has analysed data of planetary of exomoon transits from the Kepler spacecraft. Mm. And as most of you will know, when um, an exoplanet goes in front of its star, the starlight dips. Mm -hmm. And um, they were finding secondary dips because of a moon, or they're looking for secondary dips because of a moon of various exoplanets passing in front. And uh, there are light curves here, um, which have very small dips either side or in, in a position which changes either side of the main transit being attributed to um, an exomoon orbiting the planet. Now the, um, the planet is called, or the exoplanet is called Kepler 1708b, that's the first exoplanet mm -hmm. of Kepler 1708, and uh, the moon it gets the designation I, so this exomoon, candidate exomoon, is Kepler 1708b hyphen I. I. So uh, I is, is the, is the dis chosen designation for an exomoon. It seems to be the first exomoon gets called I. Um, so Kepler 1708b is a Jupiter-like planet orbiting a sun-like star at a distance of 1.6 astronomical units. And from the um, dip in the light curve, of, uh, dip in brightness of the star when the exomoon transits the star, they've worked out that the size of the exomoon is about two and a half times the size of the Earth. So it's bigger than wow. Earth. So it's a potentially habitable body. It's the right kind of distance from its, its star. But anyway, the first, it might go down in the history books as the first concern, co confirmed exomoon. So you can find it. David Kipping, now you know of David Kipping, you were telling me. Yeah, earlier. well, I just wanted to point out that he actually runs, uh, the lead author of this, David Kipping, runs a, a really fantastic YouTube channel called Cool Worlds. And um, that's a reference to, to worlds like this, this Jupiter-sized exoplanet that are at a distance from their star so that their temperature, surface temperature is relatively cool. Uh, cool worlds, and, and, and he, they do great deep dives. And, and I, I, realized, I noticed a few days ago they posted a, a deep dive into this paper where they really go through all of the different um, uh, uh, calculations they did to, to try and rule out other potential sources of this data, whether there's a second planet transiting at the same time, um, or, or there's noise in the, in the light coming from the star, and they rule all of this out, and it's a really fantastic deep dive into that. Okay. Let's um, take a live question. I've got one for you, for you oh, actually. Go on, here. then. Um, so so uh, this goes back a little bit to, the, um, to the, the, what we were talking about with Pluto and your, your story about the, the Pluto mountain uh, vul volcanism. So Derek Borland asks, do we know what the heat source on Pluto is that generates this volcanism? Uh, no, we don't. Um, Kelsey Singer and her co-authors suggest um, because the, the heat to drive this volcanism was doing its work only a billion years ago, they think it's primordial heat trapped below some kind of layer which took a while to be able to escape. It, it's kind of special pleading, really. But it's a difficult problem. Pluto yeah. is very low density. It does have a rocky core. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's too dense to be all ice. Um, but unless that rock is amazingly rich in uranium, thorium, and potassium, which is very unlikely, mm. it's the same as rock anywhere, uh, it's not going to be generating that much heat by radiogenic, you know, radioactive decay. 
um, it can't really be tidally heated. That's right. Uh, it, interacting with its big moon, Charon. Well, Charon isn't very recently active, so Pluto certainly shouldn't be more mm. active than Charon if there's tidal interaction between the two of them. Uh, maybe an impactor delivered heat. I mean, there's, there's this big basin-like feature called mm. Sputnik Planitia, just to the north of Wright Mons. You may have noticed it in the global view which is now filled with nitrogen ice, that could be a big impact basin. Maybe heat, maybe heat that's the view. Um, OK, well, a Sputnik Planitia is the big white area just to the north of that little rectangle. That's it there. Thank you, Kate. So that could be a big impact planish. Maybe the impact of it punched that hole that liberated the nitrogen ice from the interior to, to flood the depression. Maybe that deposited heat inside. Um, which um, drove the cryovolcanism. But re that's not suggested by Singer et al. They're suggesting it's trapped heat coming out. But we don't know. Um, it, it, it's a mystery. It's lovely to find these places with yeah. geological things going on, fault movements. And for me, as a volcanologist, volcanoes are to be erupted. I don't care for volcanoes ice rather than... Uh, molten rock, it's all the same process. I love yeah, it. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. And I think it, it really illustrates how when we look out into the outer solar system, we're we constantly surprised. I mean, this is the story about planetary science generally. But we look at these icy bodies and we're constantly surprised by the diversity of processes and the mysteries that they kind of hide behind it's them. It's good they don't all look like Callisto. That's right. Callisto's lovely, but one Callisto's enough. Yeah, that's like right. Ones that have other things. The live question I was going to go for actually tallies into a question that we had in advance as well. John Connell says there's a question on the moon's move. Why can't you get into a geosynchronous orbit over Enceladus? And this kind of marries up with a, a, a question that we had from, from Julian Livesey on the moon's move. He says, I imagine it would be useful to put a mission to Enceladus into, a, into something like a geostationary orbit rather than um, close passes like, uh, like Cassini did or indeed... Um, like Juice will will be doing. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and in Jupiter and Europa Clipper as well. Yeah, uh, NASA mission. Why don't you orbit these? Or, or can you be in a stationary orbit? Would you want to be in a stationary orbit? Over well, I th it's you surely want to go around it and see all of it. Yeah, I think I think when we may we might get in the future to a point where a stationary orbit makes sense if you want to look at a single region of the surface over a great period of time. But I think at the moment. We, we would learn a lot more by, by, by looking at the, the, the planetary surface as a whole and mapping, you know, and looking at the diversity of processes over a planetary surface. So orbit certainly would be a really, really valuable thing to do. And actually the JUICE spacecraft, um, the Jupiter Icy Moon spacecraft, it's Jupiter Icy Moon's Explorer spacecraft and ESA mission launching next year, will end up in orbit around Ganymede, which is very exciting. Mm. Um, and, uh, but, but really the, the barrier to doing this it, so it certainly is possible to go into orbit or even geosynchronous orbit with, with a moon like that. But um, the, the big barrier to it really is, is, is the fuel. It, it, you, you're traveling at a yes. great velocity to get out to somewhere like Jupiter or Saturn. And, and to be able to slow down enough to be captured by the gravity of one of these moons, you need to actually burn the fuel to slow down. It's a change in velocity, so it, it takes a lot of fuel, and that's mass. So we just don't have right now the capability of launching that much mass. It's a trade-off between the scientific instruments and the fuel, really. But there's another issue. Um, most moons are in synchronous rotation with their primary. That's if right. If you were in a synchronous orbit about Ganymede, you'd also your you'd have Jupiter fixed in your sky as well. That's right. So maybe the only place you can be is in a Lagrange point between. Ganymede and Jupiter. And I don't know if that would be stable because you'd have Europa whizzing by. That is an so excellent it would be, point. It yes. would, uh, orbiting moons, great if you can afford the energy, yeah. the, the, the delta V, the change of velocity to mm -hmm. do it. Which is exactly so, what Juice will do, which is actually really exciting um, to see. So wait, well, if you can wait till 2030, we'll be going into <laughs> 2032, actually, I believe. Um, so here's, here's another question for you then, Dave. This is from a, a Moon's MOOC um, learner, Wayne King. So this is now we're looking at the, at the Earth's moon, the moon, Luna. On the moon, at what depth are rocks at a temperature of, say, 15 degrees or 20 degrees or even 25 degrees uh, centigrade? Um, and and could, could a moon base be usefully placed underground where those temperatures are warmer? It would be good to be a little bit underground um, because the moon is very hot by day and very cold by night, uh, which is why... Um, 
in situ resource utilisation studies are suggesting you cover your moon base in regolith, which mm. is fairly easy to shovel around. We don't actually know the rate at which temperature increases underground or through the lunar regolith, but heat flow experiments that Apollo tried uh, didn't work very well. I had trouble hammering the probes in it and so on. But what I can tell you is um, you can calculate the, the depth in the lunar soil at which temperatures change between day and night. Hmm. And it's, it's only a, a, a couple of tens of centimetres that the diurnal heat wave penetrates. So once you're below that surface skin, the temperature is stable and you don't get the fluctuations. I mean, and I imagine the temperature down at half a metre is going to be... Some, it's going to be um, a reasonable temperature, not far above freezing, but not too hot, not too cold. But you'll be protected from the diurnal variations by um, just a few centimetres or a few tens of centimetres of lunar soil. That's right. So, so that's what you would do. You're not going down there to find a good, a, a perfect temperature. You're going down to find somewhere where the temperature doesn't fluctuate wildly. Yes, that's right. So you, you can keep everything in a stable condition there. Uh, and you're not so, you don't not have to deal with the really extreme fluctuations. Yeah, so it's three to 10 centimeters the diurnal heat wave goes. I did write it down, I couldn't see it just now. So you don't have to go very deep through the regular to find stable temperatures. Well, we're getting through these questions nicely. Um, live questions. Um, M. Wodge is saying, are there any moons? Um, of Kuiper Belt objects, um, not counting Pluto. Not counting Pluto. Well, there are. Is that uh, right? Yeah, Eris has a moon. Does it? Eris is the um, Kuiper Belt object that was the main trigger for getting Pluto demoted from planet status. It's larger than Pluto, is that right? It's not larger than Pluto, not quite, but it is more massive than Pluto. That's right. And the reason we know it has more mass than Pluto is that it has a moon. Ah. And the moon gives us the mass of the pair of them. Mm. And so Eris is about 5% um, smaller than Pluto, mm -hmm. but it has more mass in it. So Eris is the king of the Kuiper Belt, not Pluto, and it has a moon. There are other Kuiper Belt objects known that have two moons. Pluto is not the only one with more than one moon. Uh, so there are, um, there are moons in the Kuiper Belt, just as there are moons of asteroids. But the number of bodies that have moons is quite a surprise. Yes. And not really well understood, presumably captured somehow. But and that, and that, that goes back to the exomoon question, because even though th we only have one candidate so far, oh. they, surely they exist. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are far more moons than planets That's in, right. this, in this solar system. Yes. We expect there to be exomoons. Maybe not of most exoplanets, the first exoplanets we discovered were very close to their stars. Yes. If you're close to a star, it's hard to hold on to a moon. That's right. Mercury and Venus don't have moons. Um, and this is all to do with why moons tend not to have moons as well, which, which we've been asked. Yes. Moons close to planets can't hold on to moons of their own. Well, actually, I mean, why, why, why is that? What, what is the reason that a moon can't have a moon? It's, it's because they're too close to a primary... If you want, we don't teach this at the OU in 283 or the Moon's Moon, but, but the, the concept is called the Hill Sphere. Mm. I'm not sure who Professor Hill was, but that's the word, H I L L. Yeah. Look up Hill Sphere, Google it. There's, a, there's a, a volume of space around a body where it can be in charge of anything orbiting it. And the size of a Hill Sphere depends on other big bodies nearby. So um, a moon can't hold on to a moon. An exoplanet close to a star wouldn't hold on to That's a moon. That's right, because it's within uh, the hill sphere of the star. It, uh, the planet's hill sphere would extend hill, far yeah. enough. It, it, yeah. yeah. Um, but exoplanets that are more than an AU or more than half an AU from their star probably can hold on to moons. And because moons are so abundant in this solar system, we expect there to be moons all over the place. And as we said earlier, it looks like one has now been found. Yeah. How many questions did we do in one go there? <laughs> <laughs> Paul Freeman, do you envisage a crewed mission to Mars in the 2030s? How long would a return journey take? And what difficulties need to be overcome to make it a success, apart from paying for it? I think, I think that's actually quite a difficult question to answer because it's hard to predict how things will change in the landscape of spaceflight between now and the 2030s. We have 
there's a lot of commercial uh, uh, launch providers now coming online. Um, obviously, we have SpaceX flying people into orbit now, uh, and, and they have big ambitions for, for Martian flights as well. So if things really take off in that area, it is possible that we'll have people on Mars in the 2030s. Um, there are obviously big difficulties, and one, and one of the kind of big unknowns is, 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 is radiation, is, is how to keep people safe, and really what the long-term effects of um, exposure beyond the Earth's magnetic field um, could be, um, both, both for, um, well, for the people and, and the food that they need to grow and all, this, all these kind of things. Um, I think it, takes a, it depends on how long it takes, depends on the rocket, depends on how hard you throw your rocket at Mars. How, how, how much delta V you have, how much um, velocity you can pick up. But usually about six to eight months, something like that. Yeah, each way. Each way, that's right, yeah. I'm not sure how long, having got to Mars, if you want to then come back, how long can you stay on Mars before you come back? Well, that's going to depend on um, a number of things. You, obviously, you need to keep yourself alive. So either you take that with you or you have yeah. to sustain yourself with in-situ resource utilization. But also th there's launch windows. That's what was my point. That's yeah. your point, yeah. So, I mean, is it something like every 526 days? Uh, that's what I, the number I have in my head, anyway. <laughs> that's the launch window from Earth, from to, Earth Mars. to Mars. I'm thinking about from Mars back to Earth. No, that's a good you, question. You probably don't have the option of staying there a week and coming back. You may have to stay a year before you come back. I don't know the answer to that. So these are long duration flights that, yeah. that will really need you know, crews to be away from the Earth for, for possibly two years um, or, or even longer. So there's a lot to figure out to get that happening, I think. Ooh. What exciting astrobiology discoveries do you think might happen via the use of the James Webb Space Telescope? That's quite a big question, actually. Um, I, I mean, I, I think one of the, for me, one of the most exciting things is, is atmospheric composition of exoplanets, which is, which is something that's within the, the possibilities of James Webb. Um, by looking at the uh, transiting planet in front of a star, uh, you can actually get uh, the, the starlight being absorbed by the atmosphere and, and look at absorbance, and, and that can do molecule compound identification. So that's really exciting. We could see maybe oxygen or methane, one of these compounds like that. But you have to stare a long time, even a good candidate, to get a, right. a spectrum that even with the James Webb Space Telescope mm -hmm. would show you absorption lines in the atmosphere. So it'll be a while coming. That's, like that's true. It's very much at the edge of what it can do, I think. Um, yeah. It will also be looking at objects in our solar system, though, moons like Europa. Um, will it? Yeah, so there, there's observing campaigns to look for plumes at Europa, and, and that, that's you know, very exciting as well, because we might learn about the chemistry of, of, of the subsurface uh, ocean of Europa. Okay. We're going to have to stop fairly soon. Um, Eleanor is asking live, any updates on the Bepi Colombo mission? I can well, take that's one that, for you. I can take that quickly. Certainly. Eleanor, Bepi Colombo is a healthy spacecraft. There have been one or two minor glitches which have been overcome. It flew past um, Mercury last October, its first flyby. It has another flyby coming up in June or July. There are six flybys altogether before it gets into orbit, and that's when the science begins, because the spacecraft is two spacecraft stacked together until they get into orbit and separate, most of the instruments don't function properly or, or even mm. at all. Um, but there are externally mounted cameras which got nice pictures during the first flyby, which we showed in the previous Planets and Moons chat. So go back and find that on YouTube if you want to, want to see those. It's a healthy spacecraft. It's going well. And December 2025 will be in orbit about Mercury. It'll take a while to manoeuvre into our science orbits. But by March 2026... The science should start flowing. Wow. It's a great planet. It's got volcanoes, not active, but big holes in the ground blasted by explosive eruptions. Which, yes. Which pleases me. That's very exciting. It's going to revolutionise yeah. our knowledge of Mercury, I expect. Pick another question to maybe finish with. OK, what, sh what should we finish with? Oh, oh, what about the John C one? How long do ring systems last? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think? Do you <laughs> I'll, I'll fire that one at you, Dave. So John C. from the Moon's MOOC, what is the expected life of a planetary ring system? So uh, there's some various things that it might, might, have, uh, might have something to do with, but maybe Phobos, for example, the Moon of Mars, will break apart and Mars will get a ring. What do you think? 
well, Phobos is getting closer to Mars and it will break apart. I don't think it'll be a very, very spectacular ring from Phobos. Very, very but thin, small we're, ring. We're very lucky, some people say, to be seeing Saturn at the present epoch with its right. really spectacular ring system, but, mm. but much less spectacular rings of, of Uranus and Jupiter. Does Neptune have rings as well? Do they all have rings? Uranus I think, and I think Jupiter. Neptune might have tenuous rings, but yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, the glorious rings of Saturn yes. might be... Uh, um, Actually, if you gathered all Saturn's ring material together, you get a 20 kilometer body. Right. Well, maybe I did Phobos an injustice. It would actually. It, it could, could be a, uh, quite yeah. a spectacular. <laughs> uh, except it's dull and not icy. Mm. But anyway, um, so maybe Mars could have a spectacular ring if all of Phobos was spread out around its orbit. But Saturn is spectacular because we're at the right epoch. Of course, yes. Saturn's rings are being added to all the time by the plumes of Enceladus. That's right. right. The E ring. The E ring. So uh, tenuous there are images of that. If you Google it, it's, it's a very large, diffuse ring that you can't really see in the classic pictures of Saturn's rings, but it's all sourced from the plumes of Enceladus. But the main ring system, as you said, it could be quite young, which is quite amazing to think that we're, we're lucky enough to see it like that. The question from Karen Scott, who is a Karen I know, she's OU Geological Society. Has Camo been confirmed or dispelled as an Earth moon yet? I'm not sure what. I've, I've never heard of an object named Camo, Karen. But there are there are the Earth has only one moon, which is the moon. There are objects. There was an object which about two or three years ago was captured into orbit around the Earth, did about mm. two, mm. three loops, then escaped again, just a passing asteroid. Um, and then there are um, asteroids which are in a Trojan relationship That's with the right. Earth, or in a horseshoe orbit which has them in front of the Earth and then behind the Earth. So there are things which have the same orbital period about the Sun as the Earth, but they don't actually technically orbit the Earth. So there is no known object which orbits the Earth, natural object which orbits the Earth, other than the Moon. How large are these Trojan asteroids? I wrote a piece about Earth. There's two known Trojans of Earth mm. now. Mm. Uh, they're only uh, 100 or so metres across. They're right. not big. Right. Um, yeah. But it's nice to have found them. Yes. <sighs> ah, well, here we go. Well, let's wind up with this one. Danilo Pierpaoli, if you had to pick one, which body of the solar system except the Earth has the highest probability to host life? Well, we were discussing this <laughs> earlier, really, uh, in the context of moons anyway. Um, this is one that I find very hard to jump off the fence with, I have to say. <laughs> but, but, but to go with what we know right now, um, based on current data, Saturn's moon Enceladus, now I'm very happy to change my mind on this when we have more data, but Saturn's moon Enceladus, actually in those plumes coming out of the, coming out of the south polar region, there is um, methane, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen out of equilibrium with each other. And, and that is telling us that that ocean has chemical energy for life. And we're at the point now where we can do calculations to based on how many cells, how much biomass we would expect to be in the ocean of Enceladus right now. So just based on the current information we have, I would say a safe bet is Enceladus, but I'm very happy to change my mind on that with, with more information. What, about you, what do you think, Dave? Uh, I think Enceladus, well, it's easiest to sample, but Europa, if you play moon trumps, which you can do in the moon's MOOC or find it online, or even buy a pack through the uh, Euston Students Association store, but when I put the chances of finding of hosting life on these two cards, I've made Europa winner at 50% and, and then so does only 30%. Because my logic is Europa's got more rock inside, mm. hotter rock, and the rock won't have all chemically reacted with the water yet, necessarily. Unlike Enceladus, which has so such a small volume, but the water's passed through the rock and it may be chemically dead by now. But hey, we've got this reaction pathway confirmed from the plumes since then, so maybe we could reverse these. Yeah. I'm not, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. These are good places to f go looking for life and better than Mars for finding well, extant life, would you say? I think so. I, well, well, it's very hard to. Mars, the, the, the interest in Mars is very much in the ancient past, and I think. We, Mars was very lacking from our discussion just then. Yeah. But I mean, our ancient Mars is a lot, was a lot like the Earth in many ways. And I think that is also um, a, a, great, a great candidate of a place to look. But of course, 
there you're competing with the billions of years of erosion and, and weathering and, 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 and degradation. So I'd still go with one of these, one of these objects here. Yeah, OK. I think we need to... Uh, thank you for that name, Karen. Camo Oa... Is this a Hawaiian name? You're expecting me to say a Hawaiian name. Oa Lewa. Yeah. Thank you. I'll <laughs> um, have to look that one up. Thanks, Karen. We're going we're gonna, to uh, wind up here. If Ben could show me the widget score, because I can't get, get them to appear on my screen. You, oh, it's, here it is right now. Thank you. So um, you think Titan is your favourite moon. They didn't go for Enceladus or Europa over Titan. Well, and Enceladus drew with Europa, which is... That, saves us that's interesting. Wrestling. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy with that result, because I'm really I'm on the fence with those two. But um, Titan, I mean, we, we haven't talked much about Titan, but it is a, a fascinating place and a lot of complex things going on there. So um, great choice, I'd say. Well, it has lakes and waves. Rain. And sand dunes and, and sand dunes. volcanoes And rain. It's a and hydrologic cycle. Well, a methane logic cycle. As yeah. well as a subsurface ocean. Yes. Uh, so, so a lot going on at Titan, yeah. And it will have a helicopter in... 10, 15 years' time? No, 2034, I, I believe, Dragonfly should oh, arrive. 12 years' like time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your lively questions before and during. It's been a, a real fun session. Mark, thank yeah, you for your time joining me here. Well, thanks for inviting me, Dave, and it's been great fun to talk to you all. Yeah, and thanks to Ben and Kate for making it possible. There'll be another of these Planets and Moons chats in late October or early November. If you're, if you're an OU student, we'll make sure you know about it. Uh, but until then, thanks for joining us. Good luck with your exams, 283 students. <laughs>